You've heard the term, Elvis has left the building. <laughs> now, the term came about when Elvis was really popular. Um, he would do a concert and the crowds would stay and want to stay and stay and they would stay so long that eventually the, the guys dealing with the, the facility would have to kick people out. So they would basically announce, Elvis has left the building, please go home, you know? Um, and uh, it's kind of the same message. I don't think Elvis was the one that invented it. I think it was the angels that invented it because it's the message that the angels gave to, to Mary and the disciples when they came to the empty tomb. You know, Jesus has left the building. He's gone. He's not here. He's removed. He's, he's no longer in the tomb. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about it, it I, you know, just about the fact that Jesus is, is no longer in the tomb and what are the benefits or the, what is the victories that we have because Jesus isn't in the tomb? Do you know, if he stayed in the tomb, there are a lot of things that we would not have. And so I thought, you know, what is the impact that Jesus had after he had risen from the dead? What was the impact he had on those that encountered him? You see, we know that there are people who encountered Jesus after his resurrection. We talked about it last week. We talked about the fact that these are, there's evidence in Scripture that Jesus walked the earth after he rose from the dead, and he spoke to a number of people. And so... We're going to take each one of those encounters and just kind of give a little glimpse of, of what happened in those people's lives when Jesus encountered them after his resurrection. Because um, do you know that most of the disciples, if not all, of Jesus' followers, when he was put in the tomb, thought it was over. They didn't have the hindsight we have of being able to look back. They, they just assumed he was dead. He was put in the tomb. It's the reason they went to the tomb, because they went to prepare his body once more. They went to put more uh, spices and ointment and oils on his body. They went, they went to continue to keep his body renewed and restored in the tomb. And so when we see these stories, you know, it's easy for us to go, well, I mean, what's the big deal? They should have known he was, he said he would rise three days later. Why didn't they do that? Why did, why did they go there thinking he was dead still? The reality is they didn't have what you and I have. They didn't have the, the knowledge of scripture. They didn't have the writings of Paul. They didn't have, you know, the resurrected Christ walking around and the stories being there for us, for them to read. They were living it day by day, moment by moment. And so when they get to the tomb and the angel says, hey, Jesus has left the building. What do you mean? We've come to see Jesus. We've come to prepare his body once again. We've come to, and the angel said, no, 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 he's not here. He's not here. The very first person that is recorded as actually seeing Jesus after the resurrection is Mary Magdalene. She is, she is considered the first person to have seen Jesus after he, after he rose from the dead. He's the first, she's the first person that's recorded of, of actually seeing Jesus. And, and it happened on that very first morning, she went down to the tomb. And it says in Mark 16, 9, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven spirits, or seven demons. Now think about this. Mary is in this place of despair. She is not, she's not going to the tomb because she's excited or happy. She's going there because her Savior, her friend, her, her, the one who delivered her from these demons is gone. She's going there with despair and brokenness and, and, and really, in some ways, probably defeated. She didn't go there, woohoo, can't wait to see him dead. She went there broken. She went there hurting. She went there despaired over what had happened. She, she was left in this state of loss. 
Many of us have experienced that when our loved ones have passed away. We, we've experienced that loss. But she's experienced this loss. You know, like this is really pretty fresh. It was only three days ago they put him in the tomb. It was only a couple days before he was hanging on a cross. She's, she's dealing with all of these emotions. She goes back to the tomb. It's not like they had a burial service. It's not like they had a three-day wake. There's no, there, literally, they took him from the cross and put him in the tomb. There was no visitation. There was no, there was no you know, mourning over the loss or dealing with the loss. They, they literally took him from the cross, prepared his body, put him in the tomb. There was no funeral, no, no, no time of mourning. And so she is broken. She is broken. She's weeping at the tomb. And Jesus shows up. Jesus shows himself to her. He brings victory over the despair that she's living in. You see, despair doesn't have to have a hold of us. And sometimes we, we, we long, long to break free from the, the hurt or the brokenness that we have. And, and the reality is, it's encountering Jesus that things change. Paul talks this to the Corinthian church in Corinthians 4. 7 through 12, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. You see, one of the things that's come because of, of, of Christ is that we don't have to live in despair, even in the moments of despair. Even in the moments of brokenness, even in the challenges of life, we don't have to live in that place of brokenness because we have a risen Savior. The empty tomb is a, is a, is a reminder to us Amen. that He has come to deliver us from our brokenness and the heart, the broken heart that comes with that. You see, we don't have to live in despair. It's not that we won't have it. It's not that we won't have to be challenged. It, it's not that we won't have these things, but they do not have to be, be so difficult in our life that we live there. We can overcome them because Jesus Christ Hallelujah. overcame the grave. Yes. Yes. And so when you think about this, you know, despair is not something we need to live in if we're living in Jesus. Our life isn't found in this world or this earth. Our life is found in Him. Sometimes we get so caught up in the things of this world. You know, like this video, this Bible study, you know, counting your days. You know, some people, if they're counting their days, that's a negative thing. I, I, there are people who, who you know... Counting their days. Well, I got got nine and a half years till I retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got fourteen days till on my vacation. What if those fourteen days never come? Right? I mean, you know, we, we count our days. We we do this and yet. Sometimes it's such a negative thing. There was, um, there's, a, there's a secular band called Nickelback. They, they wrote a song. I don't even know the words to the song. I, I just remember seeing the video for the song. And 
this song has to do with the fact that you don't know when you're going to die. And in the video, everybody's walking around, and over top of their head is this clock that's ticking down. They can't see it. Nobody, else, like, nobody can see it, but there's this clock over their head, and the, and the clock is ticking down, it's ticking down, it's ticking down, it's ticking down. Do you know what? It's true. I thought it was an interesting video because it's one of those videos where you go, what's this about? And uh, I actually saw it in a church service. Um, I won't say who it was that was preaching that day, but there was a preacher preaching, and and he was sharing this video because he said to us, he said, you know, he was talking about the fact that we do not know how many days we have left. We have to live every day as if today is the day. And, and live for Christ in every moment, in everything that we do. And, and so Jesus shows up and Mary's despair is removed. The second encounter that we see in Scripture is Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Now, every time I read this, I think it's funny. You know, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Can you imagine being the other Mary? Oh, I'm just the other Mary. Um, it's found in, Ma- in Matthew chapter 28. It says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and set it and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they stood and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for, that I, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has left the building. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he, lay, where he laid. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them, greeting him. He said, they came to him, clasping his feet and worshiping him. Then Jesus said to, the, t- said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell your brothers to go to Galilee. There you will see me. Lord. You see, the women thought he was dead. They, they didn't know that, that it was possible. They, you know, you think about this. They all saw Lazarus come out of the grave. But the reality is, Lazarus eventually dies. Right? Lazarus, he may have come out of the grave when Jesus called him out, but he didn't go to heaven. He eventually dies again. There's a point where his body is still probably laying in a tomb somewhere. Unless Jesus took him when he ascended into heaven, there's a tomb somewhere with Lazarus' body in it. You see, the the women didn't go to the tomb because they thought he was alive. They went to the tomb because they thought he was dead. I love the fact that it says they were afraid, yet joy filled them, knowing his victory over death. Folks, sometimes, you know, we may be afraid, we may be going through hardship, we may be going through trial, but we can still be filled with joy. We can still have joy. We can still, still be filled with joy. See, in an encounter with Jesus, things change. They were still afraid, but they were filled with joy because they had seen Jesus. And, and sometimes I think, you know, it's easy for us to, to be afraid and not find joy in the midst of the, the challenges. And, and, you know, sometimes I think we forget that Jesus had victory over death. We, you know, we fear death. When death comes and our loved ones pass away, we, we, we're, we're upset. 
Now, now hear me. When one of our loved ones passes away who is saved and knows Christ, sometimes we're like, oh, you know, folks, if they know Christ and they've passed away and are no longer on this earth and they've know Christ, guess what? That's not a bad thing. It may be bad for us. We may struggle with that. We, we may feel the hurt or the, de- the, the, the despair from that. We may even feel like there's no victory. But the folks that have left, there is great victory. Because as much as the grave may hold their body, they are not at present. It says absent from the body, present with the Lord. And, and you know, I, I've had people... I've had people say this to me, you know, well, we're going to pray that they get resurrected. We're going to pray that God raises them from the dead. And you know, folks, I get it. I get that we want our relatives with us. But can I tell you, that's a pretty selfish prayer. Amen. It's selfish. Think about this. If you could right now be in the presence of Jesus in heaven and somebody prayed you back from there, would you want to come back? And what would your words be to that person after being in the presence of the Almighty? Would you really want to come back to this earth with all of the problems we have? (laughs) Right? Like, and yet, and yet we who are here. Pray those kind of prayers. And it, you know, partly because we're selfish. You know, I, I had somebody, somebody when we were pastoring in Gravenhurst, and there was a, a, a lady, elderly lady, she was in her late 80s, she passed away. But uh, while she was very sick, um, her grandson kept saying to me, I'm going to pray that God just raises her up. And then she died. And he was insistent that God was going to raise her from the dead. And uh, I had to have a conversation with him. And I just looked at him and I said, you are selfish. You are selfish. I said, do you understand where grandma is? Do you understand where she is? Do you understand that she's in the presence of the Almighty? She's in heaven with all of the angels and the glory of heaven, and you're going to pray her back from there? (laughs) Well, I want God to do a miracle. Here's the miracle that he heals your heart because you shouldn't be wishing her back from there. he, He wasn't happy with me. Um... It took him a while to really appreciate what I was trying to tell him. Um, We're still friends. Uh, Pastor Steve and I had the opportunity when we drove to Whitehorse to visit him on our way back. He lives out in Manning, Alberta. But, you know, sometimes we're very selfish in the way we pray. And these women didn't go to the tomb expecting Jesus to be alive. They went because he was dead. And Jesus shows up. He says, hey, death has no hold of me. Now listen to what it says in Acts 2, 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death, ready? For death to keep its hold on him. Grab your neighbor, not hard. Just reach out, grab your neighbor, put your hand on their shoulder. You know, maybe grab their hand if they're your friend. You know. Let me just say, let me just say, no matter how, whole, how, how hard death grabs hold, it has no hold of him. Teenagers. Teenagers always showing public affection. You see, death no longer has a hold of him. And because of that, 
Because of his resurrection, because death no longer has a hold of him, it has a no longer a hold of you. Even if you die, you will be raised from the dead. Not the way Lazarus was. You see, there's a resurrection coming for him too. Look at what Romans 5.10 says. For if, while we were God's enemy, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You see, you, 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 his blood and his death and his resurrection are the reason you're saved. You know what? If he had just died... If his blood was shed, his body was broken, he was put in the tomb and never rose from the dead, you would not find salvation. That's correct. It's because he's alive that we have salvation. Yes. Yes. Now it plays into it that his death and resurrection, his death is as important as the resurrection, but one without the other is no good. Death has no victory in our lives once we encounter Jesus. Do you understand that because of the resurrection and your encounter with Him, you no longer have to fear death? Now the reality is, death will come to all of us if Jesus tarries. Death will come to all of us. Not one person in this room, no matter how old or young you are, death will eventually come. Inescap inescapable unless Jesus comes back first. But the reality is it will no longer have a hold. It's no longer, it's no longer has victory. It no longer will hold on to you. You will not be held in the grave for eternity. You see, death has no victory in our lives once we encounter Jesus. The next encounter we find is is that there's some disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, you know, I love this story because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, we don't walk too many places anymore, but can you imagine if you had to walk to Dryden? Just pretend you had to walk to Dryden. And Dryden was where you walked to every week. You walked down from, you know, from Sioux Lookout to Dryden. Why don't we make it easy? Sue look out to Pastor Bob's favorite location, Ojibwe Park. <laughs> and, and on your journey to Ojibwe Park, you're walking along with your buddy, and all of a sudden there's, there's somebody that comes up behind you, and you hear them coming up behind you, and you look back, and you're like, oh. and you keep walking, and all of a sudden the person comes up and he says, hey, how are you doing? What, what's been going on? Now, this story is actually kind of funny. Because it's, like, it's not like it was a, a simple question, but their response to him is quite interesting. It's found in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 23, or 32. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So, you know, close to Ojibwe Park. Maybe not. Maybe five miles. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they were talking and discussing these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I love the fact that Jesus didn't show who he was yet. Because he kind of, you know, he, he kind of messes with them a little bit. He asked them, what are you discussing today as you walk along? They stood, they stood still, their face downcast. One of them named uh, Caiaphas, uh, Cleophas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these last days? Like, like Jesus asking them, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? 
Are you the only one that doesn't know what's happened? Are you like the only person that visited Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened? Are you like that dense that you don't know what's going on? Sometimes I'm, that's me. Uh, I, I, I don't watch the news very often. Uh, I, I, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time reading, reading uh, the current events because all it does is frustrate me, and I'm like, really, all I need is Jesus. I don't need that stuff. Um, but that said, you know, I kind of feel like this, because there are times that things happen, and I'm like, what? What happened? Well, everybody knows. Well, <laughs> apparently I don't. So I kind of understand Jesus, you know, when they ask him this question, I, I've had people ask me that, like, you don't know? Do you know what happened? Well, no, I don't. You know? And then he says, what things, he asks. Jesus says, what, what things are you talking about? Like, what things have happened? And, and he goes, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And, that is, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went, to the term, term, the, they went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that he, they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, <laughs> How foolish are you? And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see, now Jesus is about to turn the tables on them, right? He says, how slow are you? Because at this point, these two men walking the road down to Emmaus, can I just tell you, they didn't believe the women's story that Jesus had risen. They didn't believe them. They didn't believe what was told to them. They actually thought the women were just hysterical and did not understand anything. That's right. They just kind of writ them, wrote them off. So he says, How foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now picture this. He spoke all of the scriptures that pertain to him. Do you know how many that is? <laughs> Pretty much the whole Old Testament <laughs> is about him. And, and he says to them, do you not know? Do you not know what the prophets have said? Are you that illiterate? Are you that disconnected from my word? Do you not know what the prophets said? Because the prophets have been fulfilled today in, in, in Jerusalem with, with Jesus the Nazarene. He, he's dealing with them and he says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and, and then enter his glory? And I love the fact that it says that it began with Moses... So just picture this. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So right from day one, first chapter, you know, third chapter of Genesis, when it says that the, the serpent would heal, or the serpent, the heel of the, of, the, of the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. From that point, he starts. And then he goes through all the prophecies that Moses said about the Messiah. Then he goes through all of the Old Testament, all of the other prophets, the minor and the majors. In case you didn't know, they're divided. There's five majors and seven minor? No, I can't remember how many minors there are. Hopefully they find gold when they dig. But every one of the prophets of the Old Testament, every one of them spoke of the Messiah. So, He's telling them all these prophetic words that were spoken in the Old Testament about himself. And, and they're like, he's like, hey, are you that slow? Do you not know? Yeah. 
This must have been like the most intense conversation on the road to Emmaus they ever had. Because all of a sudden, this person who knew nothing about what was going on, apparently, those days, starts sharing with them everything that the, test, the Word of God says, all of the prophetic words about himself, all the things that were said about the Messiah, he shares with them. That's a lot. They must have just been like, and he must have been the whole way. Probably feeling pretty stupid because they didn't know this stuff. And this guy who knows nothing about what's been going on knows everything about what, what should have happened. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he, had went in, uh, when he was at the table with them, now folks, folks, this is an important, important message here. These men did not know who Jesus was. He was a stranger, but they took him in and brought him to the table. I want to encourage you as a body, we need to be more gracious and more hospitable with our family and with those we do not know. You know, they didn't know who Jesus was, but he just, he just told them everything they needed to know. And, you know, we need to open our doors and not be afraid to invite someone in to sit at the table with them. But it says, when, they, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. Now, you know what happened, right? Even before he revealed who he was, all of a sudden, you know, red lights were flashing. You know, everybody's going, oh, 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 we've been here before. We've experienced this. This, this, this is. Can you imagine? Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Now, I love this. You know, Jesus <laughs> meets these poor guys on the road. They're like thinking he's an idiot and doesn't know anything. And then he, pro 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 he proceeds to tell them everything about himself and about the prophets and everything. And he, he actually, you know, kind of convinces them to take him in. You know, oh, I'm just, I'll, I'll see you guys. I, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, hey, why don't you stay for dinner? Okay, I'll stay for dinner. You know, and he picks up the bread, he breaks it, and he begins to give it to them, and their eyes are opened, and he disappears from their sight. Now listen to what this says, they said to each other. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning with inside while well, he talked with us on the road and opened up the scriptures to us? You see, these men were talking to Jesus about the events of the day, the, the events that had happened that day. They, they were talking to him about what had happened that week. And Jesus show, you know, says, yeah, yeah, um, Jesus starts to tell them these things. You see, they were confused about what had happened. They didn't understand why it all happened. They were, they were desperately trying to put together de Jesus' death from all the things that he had done. You see, they had experienced Jesus' miraculous power. They had seen the, 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 the healings. They had seen him feed 5,000. They had seen, you know probably were there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. They had seen all of these things, and he said he would be raised from the third day, but they found the tomb empty, and they didn't see him, and they didn't believe the women who told him. They were confused about what was happening. They didn't understand. And many times, I think we are like that when we read the Scripture. We read it, and we, we think we understand it, but we don't. And because we don't understand it, we're confused. And because we're confused, we're led astray. 
We get discouraged. You see, but when there's an encounter with Jesus, yes. Yes. things change. Yes. Uh. Now, you know, in a very few, few moments from, from their encounter, almost four, you know, almost a week, in the next week or so, 40 days later, Jesus is going to leave them all. But in the next 40 days, he, he expresses so many things to them. And it's during those events that, that you know, they kind of grab hold of everything he said. But one of the things he says is, I cannot, if I do not leave, if I do not leave, the Father will not send the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit doesn't come, you're in trouble. So I need to go. I need to go. It, it would be better for you to meet, for me to leave than to not let the Holy Spirit come. John 14, 26 but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Everything. Everything. Now picture that. Everything that Jesus had told them, the Holy Spirit was going to remind them with. Everything. Not just, you know, little things. You see, when, when we encounter Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes into our life, the Scriptures become real and the resurrection is the reason for it. If it was not for the resurrection, even that would be an impossibility for the Holy Spirit to even come to you because God had to, had to let Jesus go to heaven for the Holy Spirit to come. The next encounter we see is is the ten, ten of the disciples are locked behind a hidden uh, behind a, a, a locked door, hiding, afraid. You know, the the great disciples, Peter, James, John, Peter, Peter, the guy who you know took the sword in the garden and cut the gear, guy's ear off. The guy who stepped out onto the water. The guy who had done all these things. He, he's in the room. Right? In Luke, in Luke chapter 24, 36 through 48, it says, While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why... Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. Is it, it is I, myself, touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still not believing it, it, believing it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Again, where does Jesus direct them? To the table. Get, they give him a piece of boiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Now, I don't know if you've ever had boiled fish. Doesn't sound all that appetizing. Um, it's edible, yeah. No boiling fish. Oh, does it say broiled? Oh, see, see... Yeah, boiled fish. No, you, you can have boiled fish. I want broiled fish. Broiled fish sounds a little bit more tasty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do like clam chowder. It's all right. Yeah. Um, so here they are. They're frightened. They're, now, we don't know from this passage in Luke that the door's locked. But we do know from John in chapter 20... It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the door locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So they were behind the door, fearful of the Jewish leaders, because Jesus was dead. And they knew that the Jewish leaders were trying to get rid of them. So they're terrified. They're hiding behind a locked door. Jesus comes and stands among them and says, peace be with you. 
After he, he's, he said this, he showed him their hands. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Be with you as the Father has sent me, I send you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, you know, we give Thomas a hard time. We say, well, he was a doubter. But, you know, the women went back and told them that Jesus was risen. They didn't believe them. They didn't believe him until he actually showed up and showed them the holes in his hands and his feet. So, you know, we give Thomas a hard time because, you know, he wasn't there and he wasn't going to believe unless he saw Jesus. But guess what? They didn't believe until they saw Jesus either. They were afraid. Now, I, 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 when I think about this, this image of these disciples, they're in this room, the door is locked, they're terrified. And Jesus just appears. Now, how many know that that's going to freak you out? Amen. So if they weren't afraid, they were now. And then they realize it's Jesus. So all of a sudden now they're joyful and they're excited because they now realize that everything he said is actually now coming to pass. And guess what? They are now like joyful, excited. These are the same disciples that were hiding in fear a few minutes before he showed up. These are the same disciples that in the, in the next book, in the book of Acts, become the, the apostles who actually like, take the world at, by storm with the message of the gospel. Tell me God didn't do something in their lives. You see, when we encounter Jesus, God comes in and deals with our fears and removes them. Because let me be honest, if, if, if you think you're fearful about something, guess what? The only, only person that's going to remove that fear is Jesus. Right. You can work hard at it. You know, and some of us have some fears that are irrational. But we have them. Like, I'm, I'm terrified to go on the ice. And, and all you people who have driven the ice roads or, you know, go ice fishing, I want to encourage you to continue being safe. <laughs> I won't be joining you. <laughs> now, that's a fear that I shouldn't have. When I see the ice is three feet thick, I shouldn't be afraid to stand on it, but guess what? I still am. And it's a fear that I struggle with. And, and you know, Jesus' name gets brought up a lot when I'm on the ice. <laughs> Jesus, get me back to shore safely. <laughs> Jesus, don't let me go through the ice. Jesus, I don't like this. But this isn't the fear that these guys had. They were fearful for their lives. They were being hunted down. They were fearful. But these are the same men who, who in the book of Acts, become boldly, bold witnesses for the kingdom. Then the next appearance we find is that of him appearing to the 11 remaining disciples. This time Thomas is with them. And it's found in the same chapter, literally right after it, 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 it says, later that day, or later, Jesus appeared to the 11. As they were eating, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Now see, here's the thing. In the first encounter, he didn't rebuke them for their lack of faith. But he rebukes them all for their lack of faith here. He doesn't just single out Thomas. Sometimes we give Thomas a hard time and say, well, you know, Thomas the doubter. Well, the reality is, later that Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating, he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. John gives us a little bit more description in the, in the latter half of that chapter. A week later, his disciples were in the home again. So we now know it wasn't the same day. It was a week later. 
You know, Mark doesn't tell us that it's a week later, but John does. He says, a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hands and put them in my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, we're easy to look at somebody else and find fault. Right? We're easy to look at them and say, oh, they don't have enough faith, or they, they're not, they don't trust God, or they don't know God the way I know God. And you know, I think that the disciples did that to Thomas. They were kind of like, hey, you should have been here. We saw Jesus. Sure you did. Why don't you believe us? Well, you didn't believe Mary. You know? And, and Jesus makes a point of saying, hey, you guys are, are, you, you are stubborn and you lack faith. Your stubborn refusal to believe, even those who had seen me. And verse 30 and 31 are kind of interesting. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he, and by believing you may have life in his name. You know, when we encounter Jesus, there is something that happens with our doubts about heaven, about hell, about salvation, about sin. There's something that happens when there's an encounter with Jesus. We come to a place where, where actually some of those things that we didn't know or didn't understand, there comes clarity. Jesus brings victory over our doubts and our fears. It doesn't mean you won't have doubts. It just means that He can deliver you from doubt. Is there anyone in this room who has never doubted there that God exists or that God saved you? You see, the reality is we all, we all will have doubts. We're human. The reality, though, is, is that if we would encounter Jesus in those times of doubt, our doubt would be removed because He would speak into our lives. You know, sometimes we have doubts and we talk to our friend who also has doubts and they, they you know, it's like, you know, blind leading the blind. We, we, we talk to somebody who has the same doubts as us and guess what? We're both down, the, down in the ditch together because we both believe the same thing. We're both fearful of the same thing. Do you know what? I would never go on the ice with somebody who's also afraid of being on the ice. Because the two of us would be so scared, we probably would only get about a foot... Yeah, we'd be shaking the ice so much it'd probably break. <laughs> now, I have gone ice fishing twice in my life. I went twice in my life ice fishing with a man named Askel, Finnish man in Gravenhurst, who, who said to me, Pastor, I'm going ice fishing. You coming with me? And I said, um, Pastor, you need to come. We, we need to go fishing. I don't want to go alone. Why don't you come? <laughs> Strategies, guys. <laughs> Do you know why I went ice fishing? Because I had a relationship with Askel, and I, didn't, I, did, I, I, I loved him enough that I would risk my life to be with him. Now, partly because he said to me, oh, bring Josh. Josh was about 10 at the time. And Josh wasn't afraid of the ice. So Askel showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning, or 7.30 in the morning, picked us up to go ice fishing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I want to be a good dad. I don't want my, my son to be terrified of the ice. So I go. And we get there, and we get out of the car, and he starts putting stuff in this sled, and I said, how far are we going? Oh, just over there. I thought just over there meant like 10 feet out. Just over there meant the other side of the lake. And we got out there and we we're fishing and 
And you know, I'm terrified. I'm trying to enjoy this time with my friend and my son. I'm trying to enjoy it and, and I'm scared. Like I'm sweating underneath my, my coat. I'm sweating because I'm so scared. And uh, Askel has no idea. I found out that you can pray a lot when no one's listening. My son caught a fish about five minutes into being there. And it was a good sized fish and he was pretty happy he caught a fish. And so then for the next two hours he kept saying, Dad, when are we going? <laughs> and I kept saying, not till Askel says we're going. I survived. I went one other time with Askel. And while we were on the ice, I shared with him my fear. He laughed extensively and then prayed for me and told me, it's okay, Jesus has you. But the reality is, I haven't gone since. I don't have to worry because Askel is with, with the Lord and, and he's not going to ask me to go ice fishing. And I just want to encourage you all, enjoy your fishing, don't ask. But the reality is, when Jesus enters our life, those fears, those doubts, those worries, those things that we struggle with, guess what? They, will, they can disappear. You may have them, but God steps in and helps you remove them. You know what? My friend Askel was my friend, and I knew that if I started to go through the ice, he would do everything to save me even though I was twice his size. The next encounter we find the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. And this is a story we all know. Jesus shows up after he's resurrected. He shows up at the Sea of Galilee. The boys are out fishing. They're not doing what he called them to do, which was to go and make disciples. No, no, no. They're out fishing. And he goes there and he has this conversation with Peter and he restores Peter. And we all know the story of the restoration of Peter. It's in this account where Peter you know, deals with his denial of Christ. It's in this account where Jesus restores him and says, hey, Peter, I love you, and, and, and you know, just, just do what I've asked you to do. It's in this, in this event when, when Jesus shows up on the shore and they see him and they, they put their net on the other side and they catch the tremendous amount of fish. Peter realizes it's the Lord, and so he rushes to the shore. It's a funny story, too, because he, he gets all dressed again. It says that he put on all his clothes and jumps in the water. You know, you'd think you'd take your clothes off to jump in the water, but no, no, he put them all back on and jumped in the water. And he gets to shore, and then Jesus has this conversation with him. I'm sure Peter was feeling like a failure. The tough fisherman that he was, the one who was willing to take the sword and cut the, 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 the soldier's ear off in the garden, the one who was ready to defend Jesus, then denies him and feels like a failure. I've failed. I've denied my Lord. I've, I'm, I'm messed up. Why was he out fishing? Well, he went back to fishing because that's what he knew. And many of us will escape what God's called us to do and go back to what we know so that we don't have to deal with our own mistakes or failures. And the reality was he was dealing with this and Jesus restores him. And I, I want to tell you that it, in the middle of your failure, in the places of defeat, where you feel like you've messed up, where you haven't got it all together, guess what? Jesus can show up and an encounter with him will change everything. The next encounter we see Jesus is with the 11 of them. Jesus, in, when he talks to Mary, he tells them, hey, tell the disciples to go to Galilee. There was a specific place in Galilee he had already told them about to go and meet him there after the resurrection. And they didn't believe the, disciples, the, the girls. But eventually they get there. Jesus appears to the 11 at this prearranged location on a mountain in Galilee. And while they're there, 
It says, Then the eleven went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they, were, then, when they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Did you hear that? Some still doubted. They're seeing Jesus. He's risen from the dead. And there's still some of them that are doubting. Then Jesus comes and says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now picture this. All authority on heaven and in earth. Everywhere. All things have been given to him. He has all authority. Therefore, I have all authority on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very ends of the earth. This is the greatest promise that Jesus has given any of us, is that we will never be alone. Jesus hasn't left you or deserted you or, or, or He's got another plan. He's here with you. When we encounter Jesus, there is a, a thing that happens that we are able to be a better witness. We are able to understand that He has all power and authority. And we are able to actually recognize the fact that He will be with us forever. The last encounter is an interesting one. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus appears to 5,000 or 500 of his followers. Now just picture this. 500 people. He shows up with there's 500 people. We're not talking 11 disciples. We're not talking two men on the road. We're not talking Mary at the tomb. We're talking 500 people. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, "Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand." By this, this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the words I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as, my, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he, was bru- that he was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to, uh, to Cyphus? Cyphus? And then to the twelve, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now this event that Paul refers to of, of, of meeting the 500 Many believe it was, uh, it was during the time in, book, in the book of Acts in chapter 1. It's believed that on this occasion, it says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. He appeared to them a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift from the Father who... But wait for the gift my Father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then he gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or date the Father has set by, my, by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This last encounter of Jesus we see, it's in a, a couple of days, in, in just a short moment, He's going to be taken up to heaven. But in this moment, in this encounter, He tells them, hey, by the way, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. Holy Spirit is coming. And when we encounter Jesus, He's going to send the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. You know, when, when you see in, in, in the Christmas story when you, where it says Emmanuel with us, Emmanuel is no longer with us. He's in us. Holy Spirit is in us. He comes to reside in you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. 
So, Jesus has left the building. But all the things that come with it. Victory over despair. Death has no victory over us. Jesus brings us clarity over the Scriptures if we're willing to hear Him. Victory over fear and worry. Doubt can be overcome in victory because He's risen. He's rose. We can have victory over failure if we let Jesus in. We can overcome because of the power of Jesus. But the greatest victory of all, the greatest victory of all that the death proves and his resurrection is that we have salvation. That we have salvation. This is the greatest victory that comes because the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. It's, it's the gift of salvation. It's the greatest gift that we've ever received from God is that he saved us and brought us back to himself. The greatest gift. Last week, we, we said that the resurrection day was the greatest day in history. Well, it was because it brought the greatest gift of salvation. The greatest gift was brought. You know, when we come to the communion table, we celebrate his death. We celebrate the fact that he paid the price for our sins. We celebrate his death, but the, the problem lies is sometimes we celebrate his death and forget the resurrection. But you can't celebrate one without the other. It's like Christmas. Christmas would be nothing. His birth would have no meaning if there was no death and resurrection. And his birth, his birth without death and resurrection would have been meaningless, but death and resurrection would have been meaningless without his birth. You see, we separate these things. We make them all look a little pretty and put them in a box and say, okay, during December, we're going to celebrate his birth. And, 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 you know, whenever, you know, that season they call Easter comes, we celebrate his death and resurrection. But can I just say to you that his death and his resurrection are tied to his birth and his birth is tied to his death and his resurrection. And without them all, this would be meaningless. But he who is the Passover lamb was slain so that you and I might find forgiveness. Though we were separated from the Father because of our sin, Christ came to redeem us and bring us back to that place of salvation. To bring us into right relationship with the Father. I'm going to encourage you to come. Come and get your emblems of communion. You may say, well, Pastor, we did communion last Sunday. Yes, we did. But I want to do it again today. Amen. I want to remind us once again that it's His blood, His body that was broken, His death, His resurrection that we have life. So would you come? I encourage you to just take it back to your seat and we will celebrate together.
this is a good thing that we've run out. I know how many cups were there, because I filled them this morning, so I know how many cups were there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've noticed over these last number of months is uh, I've always put out about 80 cups. And over the last number of months, we've come close to running out, and this morning, we have. How many of you still don't have any? Okay. Ernie, Ian, Ernie, come and grab these two that are here. Is there anyone else? Because if, if you can give us a couple minutes, we'll have some. It's not a big deal. There's, there's bread right here. There's crackers available. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something that happens when we gather together. You know, you could do communion at home by yourself. You could do communion by yourself. You could, you could get some grape juice and a cracker and, and, and bless it and thank the Lord for it and, and remember his death and resurrection in your home. But can I just tell you, there's something that happens when we, as a family, come together. You know, Jesus said that we are a body. He's knitting us together. He's putting us together. Each part has its own place. And, and you know, we need each other. And, and part of the... Part of communion is recognizing the fact that we are a body. That we are a body. That there is this body that happens together. You know, when Jesus said to his disciples that if they didn't do this, I thought this was funny. He said to them, if you do not eat of my flesh, you are not part of me. And that's what makes this important, that we do this together as a family. You know that person sitting next to you, that person sitting in the pew behind you, the person that's sitting across the room from you? They need you as much as you need them. And you know what's amazing is we get in our, in our mind that we don't, we don't need, we don't need each other. It's sad, but we do. We need each other. We need each other. This encounter with Jesus binds us together. You know, think about this, the 500. If there's somebody that still needs some. There's five more, come on. There's got to be somebody that wants it. Doesn't have it that wants it. Next week, I guess, or next month, I have to make 90. shared a lot of things with the Corinthian church. He shared these encounters of, of Jesus and the encounters that Jesus had with people after he rose from the dead. There's these encounters that are recorded in Paul's writings to the Corinthian church. But in Corinthians, he also says this. He, he said he knew of these things because Jesus had told him, right? He says, I now pass on to you what, what I've been told. He was told by Jesus and he was the last one that Jesus encountered on the Damascus road. And it was after he had ascended into heaven. And Paul says, you know, I, I don't even understand why I was encountered, why, why I was counted in this because, you know, I'm the least of them. I was the worst sinner. I was the one that did all these things. And, and yet Jesus came to me. Amen. And then he says to the Corinthian church in, in Corinthians chapter 11, he says, 
For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. See, Paul didn't pass this on because he heard it from the disciples. He didn't pass this on because he, he wanted to make sure the Corinthian church was doing what they were doing in Jerusalem. He passed this on because he had an encounter with Jesus. And he says, I want to pass on to you. It's interesting, if you read the chapter, the full chapter, he gives some instruction that many of us don't like. He says, deal with your hurts before you deal with communion. Deal with the brokenness you have with your brother or sister. Deal with the one that, that you know, that's hurt you. Or the one you've hurt. If you have things that you need to get dealt with, you should do. And he says all of this. And I think of the disciples. You know, they're sitting there at the table with Jesus. Do you know who was sitting at the table? Not 11 disciples. There was 12. Judas, the one who would betray Jesus, the one who would would turn him over to the authorities, the one who would be, literally, you know, walk away. And Jesus didn't say to him, oh, uh, sorry, you got issues. Um, you're not taking this with us today. No, he wanted them to understand what he was doing. And you know what? When we, when we remember his death and his resurrection, when we remember today, as we think about his body that is broken, see, I, the Lord, that on that night he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember the body of Christ today, that it extends way past this cracker. This gluten-free cracker. It extends way past that. Do you understand that the person sitting next to you is part of you? Everybody in this room, we are part of the same body. We're remembering not only Him, but also that He's brought us together. That he's made us into a body, of the body of Christ. Let us remember together. same way after supper he took the cup saying this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me the blood that washed your sins away Whenever you do this, remember what I've done. He saved you. He set you free. He delivered you. This is what the resurrection did. Let us remember his blood today that was shed for you and I. Let's, let's partake together. sound of communion. Click, click, click. Paul said whenever you, Paul, Paul repeated what Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Folks, he is risen, but he is coming back. He has not left. He may have left the building.
but he's coming back. And he's coming back, not coming back on a donkey, meek and mild. He's coming back on a white horse with a sword in his hand, declaring that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will declare his victory. Would you stand with us as we worship the Lord? If you need prayer, we're here to pray with you. Encourage you if you have not made a decision to walk with Christ, we'd love to pray with you as well. But let's worship the Lord this morning.